Hello, I'm Lori Hennessy, and I'm the CEO of League of Education Voters. Welcome to Washington Game Changers. And Washington Game Changers is a one-on-one -on -one conversation with powerful leaders in a time when we really need to hear about people who are doing good things. So we're gonna to talk to someone who's done a lot of good things today. As a state representative for the 41st Legislative District, Tana Sen chairs the Children, Youth and Families Committee and sits on the Local Government Committee and the Appropriations Committee. Tana has championed legislation to make childcare more affordable and accessible, keep our families safe from gun violence, close the gender pay gap, and secure access to mental health services and social emotional learning for our kids. And that's like all my priorities in the last 30 seconds. So this is really <laughs> exciting. After earning a master's degree in public policy and administration from Columbia, nice, Tana worked for 15 years in the government relations and communications areas in the private, nonprofit, philanthropic sectors before tenure on the Mercer Island City Council. Welcome, Representative Tana Sen. Thank you, Lori, for having me. It's great to be here with you. And um, in full disclosure, we were just talking right before we started recording how we worked at the same place <laughs> at a communications firm. I think it is a small world. 13, Doing 14, good for the community seems to run in certain circles. It's a small world. So, so tell us more about you. Why did you end up doing this whole elected official thing? What got you started? <laughs> um, you know, I've always been interested in public policy, as you mentioned in my, um, in my bio, but I really never saw myself as the as the front man. I was always like the number two, the communications person type thing. And there was a road safety issue in my Mercer Island community in my neighborhood when I really started paying attention to more of the local politics. Mm -hmm. And there were seven men, seven white men on the city council who didn't want to change the road because they thought it would, you know, reduce commute times by 30 seconds. And meanwhile, you know, neighbors and kids and dogs are getting hit and in accidents. Um, and so I jumped in and uh, and started working for to get women on the city council. And then I ended up on the city council, uh, which I loved. Uh, I had done a lot of work on urban planning, too. So it was kind of right up my alley. But in the end, I when the legislative uh, opportunity came in, I jumped at that because I really wanted to make life better for busy working families. Mm -hmm. And especially at that time, it meant working on transportation issues, working on education issues, uh, working on environmental and, uh, and gun responsibility issues. So I was thrilled to go to the state level. And that was eight years ago now. So funny hearing that story because you remind me of the Patty Murray you know, why should we listen to you? you? You're a mom in tennis shoes. I mean, how many women have gone on to elected office and hopefully more and more in the years to come because of stories like that, where they go to some council or some hearing and go, what the heck? That's not America that I'm looking at. That's so wonderful. I love that story. I'd never heard that before. Um, how, how's your family doing? First of all, I, I try to ask everyone that. Um, how are you doing during the pandemic? How have you all been um, making it through? Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, you know, pretty well. I have to say we've all been very lucky and no one's had COVID. Uh, we've all been healthy in that regard. Uh, the upside is that I had my son home for kind of an extra year because he was a high school senior when it started. And so he missed his second semester senior year and his first semester of college year, which meant he was at home with us. So that was great for us. I don't know. I, I think he managed. Uh, and then before he went off and had a kind of a bit of a college experience that second semester, but he is back off at college. Um, and my daughter definitely, it was hard doing remote learning. It was lonely. And then even now going back to schools, that was an adjustment too. So um, it has been, it has been fascinating, but having a husband who's in the uh, restaurant business and seeing the work that they had to do to completely reorient their entire business to go online um, and then being a legislator and of course working through all of the hearing about and working through all of the needs of families in our communities and our business community uh, throughout the pandemic we've, I really feel like I've had a, a kind of a bird's eye view or a or a you know a closer view uh, again with my own kids and then being so engaged in in those two uh, fields so uh, please get vaccinated people yeah. <laughs> you know my um my kids, kids are older. They're now 26, 23, and 20. That's so sad that I had to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and the 20-year-old is in his junior year in college. Mm -hmm. 
And um, we have this thing how, you know, the cultural or culture around us has always been this kind of hyper competitive culture where every kid's parents are always pushing on better grades, you know, want everything to be perfect. And my, my son and I now have this thing where whenever I talk to him, I just say, you know, bud, I just want you to know if your mental health is okay right now, if you're alive, (laughs) if you're relatively happy in college, we're good. (laughs) Um, Because it's just, it's a lot right now to be, you know, even now he goes to Temple in Philly and um, even now they're finally going back into classrooms, but it's all in masks and everything's different and it will be for a while. Yeah. I just think the whole uh, having people slow down, mm-hmm. you know, it was kind of a forced slow, mm-hmm. but even getting kids not to be doing 30 after school activities, but maybe one or maybe yeah. one on Zoom or maybe none. And you know, just having us kind of be forced to slow down and take a little bit more time to think about what's important in our lives and to focus on our self-care, I do think has been really important. Yeah, I do too. Well, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you was because of this huge, wonderful, historic thing that you did. Um, You and Claire Wilson and many others, thank goodness to you all um, Mm -hmm. and thanks to you all to help kids um, last year. And and I don't know if all that, in all the hustle or bustle and everything people are running around doing, and plus it was hard with a legislative session that was all remote. I don't sometimes know if people really get how much, what a big deal it was and what you did in Fair Start for Kids. Can you tell us about it? Sure, uh, yeah, it's almost like a few months ago and I'm like, oh, right, yes, we did that whole thing. It was just, it was, it was incredible. I still kind of I can't believe that we, we did pass that bill. So, you know, a lot of times we work on policy bills or funding bills and they're, you know, to address, you know, an issue or part of an issue. And the Fair Start for Kids really addressed an industry and from multifaceted components. So, you know, what we knew was that childcare really needed a boost Mm -hmm. Uh, The workforce was struggling, uh, families couldn't find or afford childcare, uh, and there literally was just not enough physical space. So Mm -hmm. we uh, put together a piece of legislation that was really based on hundreds and hundreds of conversations that that I had traveling around the the state to all the different childcare regions, um, you know, with Senator Wilson's long-term experience, Um, hearing, you know, just just so much input from advocates. And we focused on supporting and expanding the workforce. And so that was everything from professional development supports to uh, to higher subsidy rates, which to translate into pay, Mm -hmm. um, some uh, premium assistance for healthcare, Mm -hmm. because we knew that healthcare access was one of the biggest problems, especially Mm -hmm. during a pandemic. Um, and, and really wanted to support them with mental health supports and, um, and reward them if they were dual language or if they mm-hmm. uh, had trauma-informed experience and you know, those skills. So mm-hmm. we focused on workforce. Then we focused on access and that really was increasing eligibility for those who can apply to Working Connections Child Care, mm-hmm. uh, which is a state subsidized program. And then making sure that once you qualify, that you're not costed out by having too large of a copay. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, what we heard is people would qualify, but then they would turn down a promotion or a, a new job because they didn't want to lose their uh, their insurance, their child care subsidy. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the same note, they could barely even pay it, even with that job. So reduced copays, increased eligibility. And then we did need to move ECAP, which is the state's pre-K program. We needed to move that entitlement farther out because we just haven't met it yet. Mm -hmm. Um, But what we were able to do was add new things like all tribal youth will be categorically eligible for the Mm -hmm. state's pre-K program. Mm -hmm. Uh, Homeless youth will be categorically eligible. Uh, So we really made some improvements in that Mm -hmm. area that was uh, amazing. Um, and then, of course, not everybody's going to be at childcare, and yeah. so it was really also focused around early learning, supporting home visiting, uh, mm-hmm. and play and learn programs, and mm-hmm. uh, supports for for parents if they're staying at home with their kids or a grandparents. So really, it was this holistic look uh, to make sure that kids are you know are ready to learn when they get to kindergarten and that they have a strong start in life. So the big picture, sort of stepping back, looking at it, was as a society we've almost become sort of 
okay over the years that there were kids who would come in to school ahead of other kids um, from, from right away from kindergarten. You, you could see as teachers that there were kids who had not met the same milestones. And, and part of this was to say, what do we do to, to lift everyone up? So everyone comes in ready and having done some of that learning, right? Absolutely. When we looked at the numbers of who those kids were, mm -hmm. you know, sadly tend to be low income kids and kids of color who were mm -hmm. not, uh, did not have the same experiences and the same preparation um, mm -hmm. for kindergarten. And so once they started behind, it was really hard to, to get them caught up. And, and frankly, also for, you know, me really focused on women's issues is also a huge barrier for, for women to advance and to be in the workplace, not have access to childcare. And you know, needless to say, that really came to the fore during COVID, um, because as schools closed, people started to realize that childcare wasn't just zero to five; that is actually about uh, making sure that kids all the way up to twelve have a safe place to be. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if the schools closed during the day, but even before and after school programs. Yeah. Um, and when childcare is more expensive than college, not uh, that many families can afford it. Gosh, that that alone. That says, that says a lot. Childcare is more expensive than college. Wow. Yeah, I, I was thinking how about, I guess it was about maybe a decade ago, I worked um, on Room, this thing with the mm -hmm. Bezos Family Foundation for a while. And um, I was in meetings all the time with iLabs and folks at UW where they talked about the brain science and what it shows us about kids in those first three or four years. And I contrast that with with my early learning where it was, you know, my mom was a teacher. And so before school, we went to a neighbor's house. <laughs> we just kind of like laid there and watched channel nine. <laughs> I mean, but my um, memories are of coming into school and, and struggling to catch up mm -hmm. because, because there was just no sense. We, I don't think we were aware. And of course, this was a long time ago that those years had such incredible, profound impact on the brain. Yeah, I, I mean, we are so blessed in Washington State to have access to iLabs and to mm -hmm. really gotten kind of a bird's eye view into that research. And, you know, what we've seen is just just explosion of neuron connections in the brain from zero to five. And if you're not feeding them with mm -hmm. uh, healthy interactions and with, you know, kind of brain food, yeah. then they're not as robust. And that is your basis for the rest of your life. Yeah. And same also with the emotions, right? Yeah. Like a lot of that is just how do you, do you learn how to self-regulate? Do you learn mm -hmm. how to deal with your emotions, how to share, how to interact with people? Yeah. Um, it's, they're really critical years. Well, thank you so much. Cause it, when it was coming out, I know there was so many people in the education sector who were following this. And again, we get so caught up in all the things going on that sometimes I don't think we do a good enough job at stopping and looking at things sometimes with a historic lens of what we've actually done in the moment. Um, one thing that frustrated me when it came out was there was a lot of confusion about um, how it's paid for. Um, and confusion is my charitable phrase. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you maybe explain a little bit about that in terms of, you know, this isn't something where people who make 75,000 a year, if they sell their house, you, you know, I think that's some of the sort of um, the PR stuff that I saw out there during it. Could you clarify some of that? Sure. Um, so the Fair Start for Kids Act will be paid for a lot of it just with general fund um, mm -hmm. dollars. And then we blessedly had some one-time dollars from the federal government through the COVID relief funds. Mm -hmm. And that also has been critical and been a key way to kind of make sure that we can jumpstart these investments in, uh, in this childcare uh, advancement and eligibility and access. And then the plan is for uh, it to be funded again in great part through a capital gains tax. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know there were lots of permutations to uh, as the bill was going through the legislative process. Uh, but in the end, a capital gains excise tax applies uh, only to stocks and bonds and, and tangible assets, not to any real estate. So that was completely eliminated. So no capital gains on real estate. And then you only pay the capital gains tax if you make $250,000 in profit in one year from the sale of stocks and bonds or art or your yachts, um, something like that. And so uh, it's really only going to hit about 
Um, you know, the estimates are between eight and 13,000 people in Washington state and about the top half a percent of people would even uh, possibly pay this capital gains tax. Um, and so that is just, you know, and what we're trying to do is when you pay capital gains on your investments, mm -hmm. we can use that dollars to make the best investment we can make, which is in our little kids uh, and in our, frankly, and in our future workforce. So I think it makes a whole lot of sense. I think so too. Um, the, the investment over the years that the state has made in early learning, um, it feels as if the science has been there for a while in terms of us all knowing that early learning is critical. Those first five years or first eight years are really, really critical. But it doesn't feel like the state ever has, has doubled down on that as much as perhaps some of us expected them to. Do we feel like might we be entering a new era where that investment keeps building? Mm -hmm. I sure hope so. <laughs> I think what we're seeing is that the federal government is, is uh, cluing in on the importance as well. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started in the legislature, we the, the desperate funding need was for a transportation package at that moment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also immediately after it was the McCleary decision to make mm -hmm. sure that we are funding K-12 adequately. Mm -hmm. And so that was really, I think, taking up uh, the, the oxygen in the room and rightly so. And, uh, and so once we got those kind of quote unquote out of the way, um, and of course we always need to continue to make those investments. So mm -hmm. we're not done, but the, the major attention, um, we really started, you know, focusing more on prevention and upstream mm -hmm. solutions, whether we were looking at mental health, whether we were mm -hmm. looking at um, primary care and that kind of health, um, or in this case, on how do we make sure that kids graduate from high school? And it turns out it was around reading level in third grade, which mm -hmm. actually was uh, relevant to how you did in kindergarten, which is relevant how you did in early learning and in your first five years. So, you know, it, it has been a storytelling. Um, it has been a very sad funding uh, <laughs> avenue, I should say. Before Fair Start, uh, Washington State was spending less than 1% of our state budget on early learning. We were spending about 52, 53% on K-12, 17% on higher education, and less than 1% on early learning, this critical avenue. Mm -hmm. um, so this is so excited to be able to have for sure doubled <laughs> the yeah. percentage that we were spending on early learning. We still have a long way to go, but it's also, you know, we also have to recognize that uh, it, it's going to be a growth mm -hmm. um, into this field. So we have capital dollars that we've put forth because we really need, like we needed to build more classrooms for, mm -hmm. to meet McClary and the education requirements. We yeah. need to build more childcare, like literally the physical place for childcare. So I'm always encouraging any business or anyone who's building something large enough to include a childcare area in that. Um, so the so we're building that, and then as we increase eligibility and more and more families apply and more mm -hmm. people go into the field of childcare, we can um, we can grow that access, and that will grow the cost and how much we spend on it. But we'll also see uh, it'll pay dividends for years. Wow. Well, thank you. I um just a wonderful accomplishment. It was so wonderful to watch um, yeah. that, that kind of huge movement. And then we had things happening at the federal level at the same time. I was like, wow, it's amazing. It, it um, is exciting. And you know what, the advocates were amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and frankly, it did include the business community. So mm -hmm. we, we really, um, you know, had a tapestry of mm -hmm. folks who were telling their stories, uh, whether it was the parents, Mm -hmm. um, from low income to, you know, middle income families, whether it was mm -hmm. the businesses who couldn't hire and find employees because of mm -hmm. their lack of access to childcare, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it was advocates who were in the room or the actual childcare providers, we were hearing mm -hmm. it from everybody in all parts of the state. I mean, mm -hmm. the, you know, rural hospitals to the, you know, urban restaurants to everywhere, the healthcare providers. Um, it was really a story that just, you know, was flooding us. And so we knew we had to make, uh, we had to make some investments. And the one thing I'll just say too, is that we have made these investments, we made these mm -hmm. policy changes, but now we need people to apply. 
Yeah. For their working connections, childcare. If they mm -hmm. thought before that they didn't qualify, we need people to start looking and seeing if maybe now that they do, or if they couldn't afford it before, to now start looking at, okay, let me take another look, um, call, you know, mm -hmm. Department of Children, Youth and Families and really mm -hmm. find out if they they can now get that child care benefit uh, to, because again, if we pass something and, and nobody knows about it, the tree yeah. falls in the forest, yeah. then mm -hmm. we haven't made a difference. Um, well, and hopefully that goes how we we would love to keep spreading the word about that because yes. that's you're right the tree falls in the forest is the first step <laughs> to mix it and we need those child care workers too so hopefully we have created a little bit more of a uh, of an environment where they can you know have a living wage and some health care and and professional development that they'll want to go into and stay in that field too they are heroes truly that's, yes and that's so wonderful um well another this is an abrupt shift um you know we've talked a lot um, about some of the issues that women face. Um, one of my volunteer things is I'm on the board of the National Women's Political Caucus on our state chapter. And we really try to raise the awareness all the time about the fact that we need more women in office um, because there's a unique story that, that women understand and the experience, whether it's oftentimes handling childcare, the setback in your career that often happens, um, sexual harassment, which, you know, we were chatting earlier how mm -hmm. I'm part of Humanities Washington and I give talks about sexual harassment because that was something I experienced when I worked on Capitol Hill. And even saying that, just FYI, is part of my retraining of my cerebral cortex because I was trained to not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we're all trained to just be silent and be a little ashamed. And this, and this part of my journey is like, oh, no. No, I'm going to talk about it because I did nothing wrong. So circling back, one of the key issues is women in pay. I mean, women don't have pay equity, right? We're, we're still fighting to not have what, 70, 70 cents on the dollar. I mean, and I know this is a core area of passion for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before the Fair Start uh, for Kids Act and work on that for a number of years, the, the policy area that I was working on the most was around equal pay. Mm -hmm. And we passed uh, about three years ago now, the Equal Pay and Opportunity Act um, mm -hmm. to ensure that women could uh, ask other people, they could talk about their wages without threat of, uh, of retaliation or losing their job, that, uh, that you couldn't provide uh, men uh, opportunities like going to a conference or meeting with the highest level um, uh, clients and not offer that to women at the same level to really help e uh, even the playing field. Yeah. And, you know, sexual harassment was really, you know, some of that was front and center because people would, you know, would say things like, well, women should just, um, you know, if they just talked about it or if they just had access to it or if they just advocated for themselves, mm -hmm. then they would um, get equal pay. It's really about women not asking for it and not being mm -hmm. a self-advocate. And I would often say, okay, so let me get this right. You want the woman who was sexually harassed by her boss mm -hmm. to go to her boss <laughs> to beg, ask, promote herself for a raise? Like, it, it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense. Like you have to look at, um, you know, in the ideal world, everybody is treated the same, but we know that's not the case. So we updated Washington State's uh, equal pay laws for the first time in 75 years. Uh, and we made sure it was gender neutral. So it's really about, um, you have to pay people regardless of um, their, their, uh, their, their, gender, not their sex, but their gender. And so that also um, had good re repercussions for, mm -hmm. uh, for non-binary and trans uh, individuals as well. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, I often think about the, the curve of history of, you know, my career, I've, I've had about 30 years and the, the change in, in some areas <laughs> in, terms of, <laughs> in terms of how women have been treated. But, you know, I now have two daughters who are in the workforce and it's not all over and there, there are still things that happen in, and um, we're still working on it all the time. Well, you know, frankly, the, the childcare conversation is really actually the next step in my work mm -hmm. for women's equality, especially in the workplace, because, you know, when we see if, if women don't have access to childcare, families don't have access to childcare, it does fall to the woman 
She'll yeah. often have to leave her job or, or mm -hmm. again, not take a promotion or to reduce her hours. And with COVID, what we saw was that we're down to 1988 hiring levels for women. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just like a little blip and mm -hmm. women were more likely. I mean, it was a huge landmark shift of women out of the workforce wow. because of lack of, um, you know, place, safe places and quality places for their kids. So mm -hmm. we really need to make sure that our schools are safely reopened. And uh, that includes our, our child care is there and available. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, women can give their amazing contributions to the workplace as well. So one final issue, and I know this is near and dear to your heart. Um, you've done a lot of work around gun control, right? This is a passion of yours. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. It, it has always been um, a, an issue of, of passion for me. Mm -hmm. I remember being at the uh, Million Mom March in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. in the in the 90s and mm -hmm. bringing, you know, busloads of Jewish women to Washington, D.C. to be yeah. at that march. Uh, and then unfortunately it became much more personal for me in 2006 when I was on the board of the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle and there was a hate crime shooting that killed a friend of mine and, and um, really injured greatly five other women. Uh, and so it was again, just in my, uh, in my face and really I'd always started talking about it as um, the, the ripple effects of, of Gun violence, I think what people don't think about, you see it kind of flash in the news and maybe it gets a newspaper headline, mm -hmm. but the costs of, of, of a gun violence is, you know, loss of income, loss mm -hmm. of productivity, the mental health costs, the, the surgeries costs, the healthcare, the SWAT team, the 911, the mm -hmm. ambulance, the mm -hmm. judge, the jail, the, I mean, it just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And um, just really trying to kind of bring these uh, issues about gun violence to people's attention that it's, again, it's not just like stubbing your toe and you move on. It, this mm -hmm. is a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Well, I am. Um... Again, I just want to say thank you for everything you've done. Um, one final question for you. We're heading into session <laughs> again before we know it. What? Give us one thing you're hoping that you can do this coming session. Hmm. One thing that I hope we can do this legislative session. Maybe it's meet in person. <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. That is a good answer. You know, there's. Um, this is probably not a very... Uh, a very sexy issue, but um, one that ha that kind of permeates a lot of things. Uh, we've been hearing a lot around um, the this the care worker field, and we've mm -hmm. talked a lot about this about the the helping professions. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need more people to go into child care and into long term care and go into mental health provision and be a paraeducator, um, you know, nurse. This whole again the caring fields or the helping professions. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so I'm working on legislation to pass a care worker center um, oh, nice. where we can, center of excellence, where we can really look at how can we support um, the helping professions as an industry, mm -hmm. make it easier to transfer uh, between if you don't want to work with older people anymore, you want to work with young people, but still in the helping profession, mm -hmm. what kind of supports might you need? What, what experience and education will translate from one to the other? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm looking to see if we can't, you know, get some support and enthusiasm to really talk about these caring professions as a mm -hmm. um, as an industry and and you know we often time tell young people that you know you don't have to go to college become a carpenter or a mechanic well how about telling them you can go into child care or you become you know be a and, and work at a nursing home and take care of people like there's a lot of people who don't want to go to college or do want to go to college and also want to work with people and we need to make sure that these professions are promoted and um, and honored. And so I'm working to, to do that. Well, I am just very grateful because, um, like I said, I, I've followed you for a long time, but I went through some of your points on your website of all your key legislation and key accomplishments. And I'm like, it's like, she's reading my mind, all these <laughs> things. Um, I just really appreciate all of the amazing work that you've done. And, and thanks again for a fair start. Um, just a wonderful moment.
I know a lot absolutely. of early learning people were very happy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I have to say, if uh, hopefully, like you said, we'll be in person this coming January, although it'll be up to, you know, COVID and, mm -hmm. um, but whenever people can come down to the state capitol next time, what I'm really excited to share is that, you know, this legislative session, we uh, ban the open carry of weapons at the state capitol. And mm -hmm. so when you come down to advocate, it will be people there to share their words and their opinions mm -hmm. uh, and not through intimidation and violence to make change. So I'm really excited about that. And hopefully we'll continue to have those good dialogues around policy issues in the safe uh, environment. So I'm All happy right. about that too. Well, it's great talking to you. Hopefully next time we won't be in our bubbles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll run into Thank you, you in town if I ever leave my house again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Representative Tonneson. It's really wonderful talking to you. Thanks, Lori. If you have additional questions or comments, you can send them to me. You can reach me through our website. A recording of this presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org. And I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and everything else. I don't recommend you find me on Facebook because I post a lot. <laughs> but seriously, find me in any of those channels. And we are happy to stay in touch at League of Education Voters and follow the good work of people like our guests today. Thanks again. Nice talking to you.